uh, the capital city is called Banjo. So I'll be joining you from there today. Um, we Today's training might be a little bit different from what you are used to uh, because of uh, internet issues and stuff like that. Uh, maybe you may not be able to see my face. But uh, this is a topic I really wanted to, you know, um, have a conversation with you on because it's something that has uh, a lot of implications to all of us as M&A professionals. We cannot ignore the concept of data. In the direction that the world is moving today, we are moving in the direction of data-driven interventions. Every intervention that you bring on board must be data-driven. Um, we must justify uh, whatever decisions that we make by presenting credible and reliable and verifiable data. Um, our ability, therefore, uh, to collect and analyze data and relevant data becomes very key in our journey in monitoring and evaluation. And by the way, it's not just in m and &E, but in uh, all the other fields. I, I, I always uh, see people succeed when they appreciate the place of data and data management in the whole concept of uh, decision making. But sometimes uh, people complain to me and they tell me, Benson, in as much as I'm a professional, there is absolutely no way I can be able to collect data about or concerning, let's say, 10,000 people or 20,000 households. How do you tell me to collect data if my intervention focuses on 20,000 households? How do I collect data and use it for decision making? And that is why one of the things that I want to talk about in this series of uh, sessions on data management is on how we can collect data regardless of how big our population is and how we can ensure that that data is of uh, very, very good use. Sometimes people come in and, and tell me, um, you've talked to, to us about, uh, for example, baseline. How can I uh, get baseline when my population is very big? Um, and uh, today I want to talk to you about how you can ensure that regardless of how big your population is, you can still collect data that is very, very credible. And the way you do that is through sampling. And therefore, my first conversation with you is going to be on sampling. Now, sampling um, is a process whereby we take a portion of the population, we research on that portion, then we use the results or we use the, uh, the information we get from that portion to make inferences about the entire population. How well those inferences are depend on how well we chose our sample. If we did a very good job in picking the sample, then the decisions we are going to make about the population are going to be accurate. So what are some of the methods that you can use as an m and &E professional uh, to do sampling? And this is what I want to talk about in the next uh, few minutes. Now, we have uh, two main types of sampling, and I think this is something that probably most of us are uh, familiar with. The first one is probability or random sampling. And this is the one that is the mostly uh, acceptable form of sampling. In this uh, category of uh, sampling, we say that every unit of target population has an equal calculable non-zero probability of being included in uh, a sample. And the methods here include the uh, probability sampling, simple, systematic, and random sampling uh, exactly, we're going to be looking at that. So when it comes to probability sampling, if you have 10,000 households 
each of those household has an equal chance of being included in the sub. There is no, we are not uh, sure exactly who is going to be in the sample and who is not, because everyone has an equal chance. Of course, that chance is uh, can be calculated and it is a, has a non-zero uh, probability. So we're going to be looking at that in a minute. Now, we also have non-probability sampling. Remember, the first one was probability sampling or random sampling. Then we also have non-probability sampling. Now, these methods do not employ the rules of probability. Okay? Uh, they do not ensure representativeness, all right? And mostly used in exploratory research um, and qualitative analysis. We are going to see the differences. But in non-probability sampling, um, there are some people within the population that are sure they are not going to be picked. Okay? For example, we can have a population of uh, 10,000 people, but we say we are only going to pick anyone above the age of 20. So anyone below the age of 20, I mean, they are not going to be picked. So they, they, are, they, are, they don't have an equal chance. In fact, they don't have any chance at all of being picked. So let's get uh, a little bit deeper into that, uh, random sampling techniques. So as we said, all units have this, uh, some chance of selection that can be calculated. This ensure that bias is not introduced in the survey, and these include a simple random sampling. You can use systematic sampling. You can use a stratified sampling, a cluster sampling, and multi-stage sampling. Now, my objective for today's session is for you to understand each of these ones and what it means and ask yourself how can I use it uh, to ensure that I am using data in my decision making. So ensure you understand these five methods of sampling. Um, I'll go to each one of them um, very quickly. Now simple random. What do you mean by simple random? Now each unit uh, in a population has an equal chance of inclusion in the sample and is the independent on uh, from each other. That means the inclusion of one person in the sample does not exclude the other person from being included. Okay? The method is simple and easy to apply even when uh, small uh, populations are involved and it can be cumbersome for large populations. So sometimes we avoid using a simple random sampling uh, when we have very large uh, uh, populations. But when it's, it's a small one, we can use. So, so when, when uh, imagine you have uh, uh, balls in a jar, and then you close your eyes, you dip your hand in a jar, and you pick one at random. OK? That is ra uh, simple random or you have a, a list of numbers, and then you pick one at random. So that is simple random. Now, when it comes to systematic sampling, it's different from simple random. Systematic sampling, it's called interval sampling. Now there's a gap or interval between each selection. So you have uh, 20 people, you tell them, stay in a line then I am going to be picking every third person, every third person, every third person. Now, what makes it a probability sampling? Okay? You can say, for example, selecting every tenth person. After selecting the first person at random, so are we going to start at number one? Are we going to start at number two? Are we going to start at number three? That starting point is selected at random. Therefore, that makes this system or this sampling uh, uh, probabilistic, okay? So that is a systematic sampling. I'm sure you understand that. You have intervals, but you pick the first person at random. How about stratified uh, sampling? Now, the population is divided into groups called strata. Then a sample is drawn from 
within this strata. Uh, general problem with random uh, sampling is that one could by chance miss out a particular group in the sample. Okay. However, if one forms a homogeneous set uh, of groups from a population, sample is picked from each group. Uh, one can uh, make sure the sample is representative. Now imagine you have a class of uh, 20 students and you need six out of the 20. You say you're going to pick them at random. So the class has 20 people, 10 of them are girls, 10 of them are boys. If you, uh, if you pick at random, it is possible that you'll get six of them who are girls or six of them who are boys. How about you take the girls aside, you pick a sample from them and you take boys aside and you pick a sample from them. That means that each of the groups or each of the strata, if you want to put it that way, is going to be represented. So that is what is called stratified uh, sampling. Now, cluster sampling. Uh, the population is divided into groups called clusters. Uh, uh, a number of clusters are selected randomly to represent the population. All right, all units within the selected clusters are included in the sample. So we have uh, departments. We have, let's say, we have ten departments in an organization. Um, and each department has five people. So you pick a department at random. Once you pick a department at random, let's say finance department, everyone within the finance department becomes part of the sample. All right? Now, I really hope you understand the difference between uh, cluster sampling and stratified sampling. It's very, very important. Uh, for us to understand that. So no units from non-selected clusters are included in the sample. They are represented by those selected. So if if we have uh, people from HR, uh, but they were not, you know, selected, uh, they're going to be represented by the cluster, that is the finance department. Now we have multi-stage sampling, okay? Multi-stage sampling. Uh, is like cluster sampling, but involves selecting a sample within each chosen cluster rather than including everyone in the cluster. So for example, let's say you have 10 departments. Each department has 10 people. You pick one department at random, let's say finance, and then from the finance team, you again choose one of them at random. That is why it is called multi-stage. Okay? So you first of all select a, a department at random, then within that department, you select the sample at random. Right? So the clusters are designed to contain more units than required in the final sample. Um, that is a multi-stage sampling. Now, so those are the probability sampling methods. Ensure you understand each one of them. The other ones are non-probability sampling methods. Now, the methods do not employ the rules of probability theory. That is, they do not ensure representativeness. And as we said earlier, they are mostly used in exploratory research uh, and qualitative analysis methods. So they include the convenience, judgmental, quota, and snowball. Let's see what each one of them means. Um, convenience. Now, the sample is selected based on the convenience used in exploratory research, where the researcher is interested in getting uh, an inexpensive approximation of the truth. And for example, let's assume uh, you're working in the capital city and you want to get information about uh, non-governmental organizations in your country. You can choose to study the non-governmental organizations that have a headquarter in the capital city. 
you can choose that because it is more convenient it's nearer where you are it's as simple as that convenience is i mean it's easier to get to the people in question um then judgment or purposive now some people are selected based on judgment or purpose that they are relevant to the project and one may decide to draw the entire sample from one representative division uh, from a number of divisions. For example, um, when I was doing my, uh, my PhD in uh, uh, resource mobilization, I used a bit of this in as much as mine was multi-stage, one of the stages was this, because I was focusing my research on the strategy of the organization. Obviously, I could not ask uh, a customer service assistant about the strategy of the organization. So I had to be, to, to, to pick the right people. So I had to first of all pick the organizations at random. So once I have my organizations at random, within that organization, now I pick either the CEO or the head of strategy or whoever. Okay, so purposive, very, very important. Then there is quarter sampling. Now, like in stratified sampling, the researcher first identifies the strata and their proportions as are represented in the population. Then convenience or judgment sampling is used to select the required number of subjects from the strata. Okay? So you first of all um, look at how many youth are there, how many women are there, how many men are there. Okay? So we have three strata. If the youth are 80% of the entire population, then you select 80% of the sample size from the youth. Okay? Like that, from, then from the men, then... I mean, it's, it's also sort of a, sort of a multi-stage kind of a, a sampling. And then there is a snowball sampling. Now, snowball sampling is a special non-probability method used when the desired sample characteristic is rare. It may be extremely difficult or cost prohibitive to locate uh, respondents, okay? I, I was talking to a friend of mine and uh, my friend uh, works among commercial sex workers. So what he does, his organization trains them on business skills, um, provides them uh, capital to start businesses so that they can graduate from that practice. So I was asking him, how do you get these people to come to your trainings? Because nobody wants you know, to be said, oh, this is the kind of work that I do. How do you get them, to, how do you convince them? And he told me, it's very simple, you just get two. You bring them for the training. Then you tell them, tomorrow, everyone come with two friends. So tomorrow, they are going to be how many? Uh, they're going to be six. Then you tell them, tomorrow, everyone come with two friends, like that. At the end of the day, you have a huge group of people coming for your trainings. The same case happens also with um, drug addicts, when you're dealing with drug addiction and stuff like that. Snowball sampling uh, helps a lot, okay? So, so my hope is that you have a, a, clear, a clearer picture on how you can use sampling in data collection so that you're able to have accurate data that is representative so that we get away, we, we move away from making decisions that are not based on data. We are saying we need to ensure that we have data-driven decision-making. But the question is, even when you have uh, this data, the quality of the data determines the quality of the decisions that you make. The quality of your data determines the quality of the decisions that you make. And therefore, it is very, very important 
for you to ensure that you have very high quality data. So where does data quality fit in your work context as an M&A professional? Data quality is measured by how well M&A data tell the true story. Is there a difference between actual results and the reported results? Is what m &E is telling us, is that what is on the ground? Okay, or is there variation? You must ensure that your data is of very, very high quality. Now, some of the elements of data quality, and I know um, we mentioned this when we were dealing with uh, indicators, and we said that uh, data must be valid. That means that data measure what they are supposed to measure. Okay, it must be reliable. That means everyone defines, measures, and collects data the same way all the time. And that is the consistency. Data must be complete. Okay, meaning that data include all the values needed to calculate indicators, and no variables are missing. Precision, data have sufficient detail. Units of measurement are very clear. Timeliness, data is up to date. Information is available on time. And integrity, which in my opinion is the most important. Uh, data are true, the values are safe from deliberate bias and have not been changed for political or personal reasons. So in trying to understand the difference between validity and reliability. Uh, there is uh, some graphic I want to share here. Imagine you want to hit the target. How well do you hit your target? In this case, your data is scattered all over the place. And therefore, it is neither valid, okay, nor is it reliable. In this case, your data is consistent. It is reliable, but it is not valid. All right? And finally, your data is valid and it is reliable. That means it is consistent and it is consistently doing the right thing. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is just the first session in a series of sessions that I want to talk about data and data management. I want us to get to a point where we adopt um, a mentality of using data all the time in making our decisions, especially as m and &E experts. The next session that we are going to be talking about will include data analysis. When you have a set of data, maybe in an Excel sheet, how do you uh, analyze it? How do you work around that data to ensure that you create a picture that can help you in decision making? It is very, very important for us to do that. And my hope is that uh, we are all considering uh, taking some data analysis courses. You can, uh, I would uh, strongly recommend uh, you take a course on advanced Excel, okay? Maybe advanced Excel would be uh, a good one. Uh, some people also consider taking SPSS um, so that you are comfortable with data, but as an M&A professional, you must be very, very comfortable um, with data and the use of data in decision making. Thank you for our session today. Thank you. Let's uh, wait for the next session that will be on Saturday. Let's speak. So that uh, we will now listen to the presentation uh, and a video of the presentation. We will be able to ask some questions and see. We will now have a lecture.